Let's open our Bibles to the book of Job, chapter 31, and as we do so, a couple of other announcements that I want to share with you, and, uh, and then we'll get into our study. We'll be looking at uh, the chapter. Uh, it was mentioned that we have um, an Israel trip that has been planned, and now is we're going to, in the Lord, we're going to move forward with it. Anyway, Israel, we were talking about that, weren't we? Um, we have 207 people who have signed up with a desire to go to Israel. That blows my mind. We've never seen anything like that before. But I did notice that John has signed up 123 <laughs> times. That may be messing up the count, which tells me that there's a great interest to go. And uh, I, I love Israel. My wife, Marie, and I don't even know how many times we've gone. We've gone at least 27 times, and it's just a blessing to go every time we go. And I would love you guys, obviously, to be able to go with us. And if you can, we'd love to have you. And so the dates have been settled, the, the, the price, we're still working on that, but I'm working with them to keep it down as far as we can. Um, 4,300, 45 at the max, but I'm hoping to keep it down just letting you know for those of you who would like to go with us. And so that will be, uh, God willing, coming up in, uh, next, in next year in, in March. And so a second thing I'd like to share is a, is a praise report some of you are already aware of and others may not be. On Sunday, this last Sunday, um, I was home and my, my daughter called me, my daughter Corinne, and she was in tears. We have a, a family in our church. Um, their last name is Rosales, like my own, though they're not related to me. And um, Robert and Val, and they've been with us many years, and um, they have like six babies. And as they, they, the babies have pretty much been born in this fellowship, and I've dedicated, I believe, dedicated all of them. I'm, I'm thinking I have. And, uh, because my last name is the same as theirs, the little girls don't, you know, there's four girls and two little boys, um, they don't have a grandfather. So they've kind of adopted me, you know, and so I think that's cool, I like that. And so I, I dedicated one of the babies uh, not that long ago, and, and I forget what the girls will do. They, they will always walk up and hug me, they always do. And even when I was dedicating, the baby, just before I did that, here come the little girls, they've got to hug me, and it's just a real precious thing to me. And so a couple of weeks ago, I was walking to a meeting after a Sunday morning, and here they come running up, everyone, one at a time, and they're all growing older now, and the little one, uh, one of them is two years old, Brisa, and she she comes toddling up, and you know, she's a little toddler, and first for her first time, she grabbed my leg and she gave me a hug for the first time, that I've had a hug from Brisa and everything. So she, they're dear to me, they mean something to me. So I get a phone call on uh, Sunday night. My daughter's Corinne is in tears because Brisa had fallen into a pool and drowned. Yeah, she fell into a pool and drowned. They, don't, they didn't know how long she'd been in the water. They noticed that she was gone and looked for her and ran to the pool. And there she was at the bottom of the pool and they pulled her out, and she was blue. And uh, Robert was on staff here for a number of years, and we've had um, CPR training. And he put that training into practice and began to attempt to resuscitate his baby. And it was at a, a nurse, a, a friend of theirs who was a nurse, and she was doing what she could. And an ambulance came, and I get the phone call, and my, my daughter is saying, Daddy, she's saying, uh, Brisa drowned and they're rushing her to Loma Linda. She, this is what her words at that time were, she's in a coma, Dad, we've got to pray. And so we wanted to, to guard their privacy in some ways. I'm, I'm not one who thinks you should just go out and blast people's names, you know? I think sometimes it's, it's, it's the proper thing to do, it's because I'm invading the parents' privacy, is to say, we have a situation, please pray, and you know, leave them unnamed to the best of our ability. And so. There were people who were aware and were beginning to pray. And my wife and I and my son Joseph and his wife Karina, my, all my kids know them and love them. 
And so, you know, in different places, different homes, they're praying, and, and those who heard were praying. And, and I, I woke up many times during the night, you know, you know, praying for the poor little baby girl. And the next morning, uh, or the next day, I forget if it was what time it was, I got a phone call, and Bree says she came out of it. She's breathing, talking, laughing, eating. God did a miracle. God did a miracle. He did a miracle. And I just, uh, you know, in the midst of all the bad news, isn't that good news? I mean, that the Lord is still on the throne, right? Uh, he's still on the throne. I, I don't know why he doesn't answer every one of our prayers like that. I wish he did. He doesn't. But you know what? He did this time. And so I just wanted to give that report to you before we get into the word. Our God is still on the throne. Our God is a healing God. He is able. And uh, <laughs> I just, uh, just before I came in, I saw a video of her, you know, um, talking and laughing and and I'm just so, so very blessed. And I know Robert and Val, if any of you knew, and we're praying, I know that they would personally say thank you. And uh, on their behalf, for those who are aware of this, we, we thank you for your prayers. And, and uh, how appropriate it is that we know that our God answers prayer. And then tomorrow is the day of prayer. And I hope and pray that you're able to be with us tomorrow night. And if you can be with us in the prayer in uh, Chino City Hall area, uh, that would be a blessing too. But that said, here we go. Chapter 31. I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 4. And uh, get into our study. And Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above? And the inheritance of the Almighty from on high. Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? And so at this point, as we're looking at the book of Job, Job is continuing a speech that he began to give in the chapter previous to this one. And uh, in this particular um, speech, this defense of his, of his life and character, he begins to speak concerning his own moral purity. Now, he's already pointed out that he's lost the respect of his community. He has already pointed out that he feels that he's been abandoned by God and man, and he says this is totally unwarranted and this is completely unfair. We've been looking at the book of Job, and we've seen that uh, the way they were speaking of him and how he had lost everything, including uh, the respect that he once had, and we've seen that this was something, this losing of respect was, was something especially injurious to him. In chapter 30, he had spoken of how he had been treated. He, he spoke of how he had lived. His life had been one of faith, he says, of honor, integrity, a life of generosity, kindness. That's how he had lived. And so now he continues his defense by speaking of his own moral purity. And so in verse 1 here, he says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? I have moral purity. I have a desire to, uh, to, to have a pure life and all. And, and I made an agreement. I made a, 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 a testimony between me and my eyes. In other words, I have, a, I have made a, a, a heartfelt um, decision that I was going to live in a proper way. I made a covenant. I'm going to live a morally pure life by choice. And he's saying that I've been morally pure. He's saying, I don't lust after women, and I haven't since my youth. In Psalm 119, verse 37, the psalmist said, turn my eyes away from worthless things and revive me in your way. When he said, turn my eyes away from worthless things, the word worthless speaks of the false things of this age, of this world, the false things that can, that can tempt me and seduce me and draw me away from God. That would include things like riches and man's honor and, and, and physical pleasures. He says, turn me away from the wicked things that would lead me in the wrong path. 
Make my eyes pass quickly from such things so I don't stare at them and long for them. Because his desire is that, that God would give to him life. And he's saying, I don't want to contemplate on these things. Because when I contemplate, when I think about something long enough, I begin to desire that. So empower me. Empower me with the desire and strength to walk away before I'm ensnared. Instead of me giving my, my strength to these kinds of things, he said, uh, empower me to serve you first. Well, Job is one who said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. And I don't want to look on those things. I don't want to look upon a young woman. The, the word woman there, when he speaks of a woman, speaks of a young woman. Um, I, don't, I don't want to be looking at a young woman with lust. I don't desire that at all. Billy Graham was once asked, what are the things that a young minister should be aware of? What are the things to avoid? And Billy Graham's answer is very brief and to the point. He said, what are the things that will cause a, a minister to fall? He said, pride and women and money. Those are the three basic things that Satan uses to, to tempt people from Genesis. He did that with Eve and with, uh, you know, uh, sexual pleasure or sensual pleasures and all. And that's what he he actually tried with Jesus when he was tempting him. It's uh, pride and, and physical pleasure. And uh, those are things that are called worthless. You know, uh, as a young man, our, our, church, our church is going to celebrate uh, in a couple months. We're going to celebrate our anniversary, our church anniversary in July. We're going to have a Sunday night service, by the way. I'll add those things to this. And, and uh, it's going to be on July 25th. It'll be in the evening. And uh, we're going to have uh, several worship teams that were with us in the past and reminiscent this and that. I was 30 years old when this church began. And, um, and I knew, I knew these things. I knew that, that what was awaiting me as a pastor was going to be the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I knew that. I knew that the things that could, could seduce me, that could bring me down, would include being enticed in that way. I especially wanted to remain a good husband and faithful to my wife and to be a good father to my children. And I wanted to, to make sure that my moral purity was uh, intact and remained so. And so I made a covenant with my eyes, an agreement with my eyes, that I would not lust after a young woman because that's basically what he's saying. Why should I look upon a young woman? Why should I be looking at this young lady and just continue to contemplate her and to look at her and ultimately desire her he said, why would I do that? I made a covenant with my eyes that I wouldn't do that, and so did I. And so I remember saying, Jesus, I, I, I want to have a pure life. I want to have a great marriage. I want to be a good husband. I never want to cause my children or my wife pain. I made a covenant in the same way. I, I understand this phrase. I understand this covenant. And so I was in church, and it was when our church was maybe a year and a half old. It was starting to grow, and I was out during the time of worship. We used to meet at the Ontario Christian Elementary School and a small, small room there that made into a chapel, sat about between two and 300 people, 300 at the max, and we uh, were there, and I would come and I sat in the second row, and I still remember, I would sit in the second row and I would worship, and then I'd go up and teach, and, and all very much like I, I did tonight, and, and yet this one time, I was sitting there, and this blonde was in front of me, long curly hair over the shoulders, I still remember, wearing jeans, and, and I was sitting there, and I, I happened to look down, and I saw lacy underwear. Okay, I said it, and, uh, and I said, oh, God, no. I, I, I still remember, I still remember. I don't, I don't need that. I don't, I got real, uh, I closed my eyes real tightly. And I made sure I was going to look at that woman, and, and I kept my eyes, oh, God. And then I got up, and I even didn't look in that direction when I walked past, didn't look to my left to say, hey, baby. I didn't do that. <laughs> I, 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 just, I just walked past, and I went up onto the platform just like I just did, and I walked, and I stood here, and I had to look down. And when I looked down, that girl I looked at was a guy. <laughs> I felt twice as bad. <laughs> it 
Yeah, I'll let that settle in for a minute. Yeah, it was the most horrible, uncomfortable. And I said, John, you're pretty as a blonde. No. So I understand. I understand. I understand this scripture in many ways. And I made that covenant, and Job made that covenant. I don't want to think of those things that will take me away from you. I don't want to, 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 to look at the worthless things of the world, uh, the vain things of the world, uh, the riches of the world, the honors of the world, uh, the pleasures of this world. I, I want to be turned away from these things. I, I want to be turned away from the things that can lead me down the wrong path. And therefore, he said, empower me, not only with the, the, the ability to, but with the desire to, refrain from anything like that. I don't want to be ensnared. Well, when you think of it, Job was at one time very rich. And with riches comes power. Riches are equated with power. And riches are very attractive. And speaking from a masculine perspective, a rich man, riches, men know that riches can be very attractive to some young ladies. They know that. They're equated with power, and that can be attractive to certain women. Now, remember this book, the book of Job. Remember that the book started out by saying that Job was the greatest of all the people of the East, the greatest of all the people of the East. In other words, he was the financial equivalent, we'll say, of Jeff Bezos. Now, Jeff Bezos, many of you know Amazon and this and that. Jeff Bezos has a personal worth of $200 billion, $200 billion. And so riches can be very attractive to women. As a, money, as a matter of fact, uh, money can make a man more attractive. So somebody asked me a riddle recently. They said, this is the riddle. If an 80-year-old man has a 29-year-old wife, just how rich is that man? Because that's pretty much what it is. Money attracts. If that was an 80-year-old old man who was poor, you think a 29-year-old beauty queen would go after him? Of course not. Why? Because money is attractive. And Job was aware that money made him attractive. And because of this, very early in his life, he made a covenant with his eyes. And he begins by speaking of a sin that is not always noticed by others. Notice it. He's speaking of a sin that is lust for women. Now, this is a sin that can be a secret because it originates in the secret place of the heart. So instead of secretly lusting for young women, he said, I covenanted with God to resist this. Because this particular sin has captured many men and women. In Proverbs 6.25, it says, Don't be tempted by their beauty. Don't be trapped by their flirting eyes. You see, sometimes I'm concerned because I know that many Christians can often be vulnerable to seduction. A believer can be naive, gullible, trusting the wrong person. And we can think that because people go to church services, well, they must be Christians. They come to church, they carry a Bible, they go to studies, they're involved in the church, and we can begin to think that these people are very sincere in their faith. But once these people have convinced us that, that they're safe, we can end up destroyed. Sexual sin is never without a genuine victim and a genuine price that is paid. When you read the book of Proverbs, chapter 5 is a chapter dedicated to encouraging Solomon's son to avoid sexual sin. And Solomon begins that chapter by telling his son to pay attention to his wisdom and his understanding. And he goes on to say this in, in Proverbs 5, 3 through 5. He says, the lips of an immoral woman drip honey. Her mouth is smoother than, uh, than um, well, anyway, smoother than what? I, oh, that's right, oil. Uh, just making sure that I didn't put the O here, and I thought, ill, what's that? Okay, <laughs> oil, and I, and I had a brain freeze. I made a covenant with my mind that I wouldn't remember the word oil, and look, it worked. Her mouth is smoother than oil. 
but in the end, she, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of hell. And so he began to speak concerning those things. What is he saying? Well, he is saying to his son, an adulteress can lead you on a path that takes you to hell because that's where adulterers end up. When you look in the New Testament in chapter 5, verse 5 of Ephesians, it says, of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You see, in our day, this verse, I have made a covenant with my eyes, why then should I look upon a young woman? And other verses in Scripture, uh, in our day, those things are, by even believers, are very often discounted being without value. They'll, they'll, they'll say things like, well, <laughs> wait a minute, what's the big deal anyway? A little sexual fun has never hurt anyone. But they don't realize that there is no sin that doesn't have repercussions. Every sin does. That's why in Proverbs 5, again, in verses 9 and 10, it says you, you give your honor. That word honor can be speaking of your, your strength, your energy. You give your honor to others, your dignity to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enriches the house of another. So he says, listen, when you enter into an adulterous or a sexual affair, you can end up spending the prime of your life working for someone else. When the divorce proceedings clear up, you end up giving your wealth to someone else. Um, in our terms, you're going to have expensive lawyer fees. You're going to have alimony. You're going to have child support. In, in, in Proverbs 5, again, verse 10, it says, Strangers will feast on your wealth, and your toil enriches the house of another. So you marry another woman. You, take up, you end up taking care of her children, and you lose your own. And the inheritance that you were one time going to leave behind for your own kids will go to somebody else's. He says in Proverbs 5.11, you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed. You can end up with nine regret at the end of your life. Your kids grow up, they graduate from school, they get married, and you're not involved. Sometimes you're not even invited to the weddings or graduations. And you don't end up with a good relationship with your, your children or your grandchildren. And in the end, another man is considered your children's grandfather. For what? When he says in Proverbs 5.12, he says, you say, how have I hated instruction? My heart despised correction. He's saying, you end up your life with wasted dreams and nothing but I wish I would have. If only I would have will be your last words. So Solomon's instruction concerning this as it relates to making a covenant with your eyes is in Proverbs 5.18, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Have children, but have children with your wife. Let your sexual thirst be quenched by your wife, not someone else's wife. You see, the fear of the Lord, willing obedience and the power of the Spirit can make a way of escape for you. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, such as, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? How am I as a man, speaking again from the male perspective, how am I to act towards women? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 2, Paul said we are to treat the younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Seeing that men can be distracted and tempted, what can women do to be of help to us? Sometimes women think, well, if you lust or you look, it's your own fault. I, I Many years ago now, I can say this, it's been almost 35, 36 years or so ago. Um, I had at one time a secretary, and she was in working in the front office. And um, I came walking in, and as I came walking in, again, you've got to see, I was in my mid-30s at the time. So I came walking in, and, and she was uh, standing at the, uh, uh, the counter, 
speak into somebody. And as I walked in, I I'll be real with you guys. I mean, she was wearing a very short skirt and I felt that's inappropriate. You know, we're in a church. We got, you know, you know, we're supposed to set an exam. I, mean, I had so many reasons why I thought it was, and it was, it was inappropriate. Plus the fact is that we minister to men and sometimes they have problems in this way. Why would we do that? And so I'm not one who will walk up and tell somebody something. I'll have somebody else do it, another woman, not me. So one of our secretaries, I spoke to her and I said, could you speak to her and let her know that she probably, well, not she should probably, that she should not dress wearing, you know, short skirts and things. It's just not appropriate for a period, but also for a church. And so the response was that the secretary that was spoken to quit and her response was, if he's got a problem with his eyes, that's his problem. Well, that's not true. That's not just my problem. Because we can stumble people in the way that we act and the way that we dress. And, and it just is the height of narcissism for us to say it's all about me and who cares about you. And so the bottom line is, is no, I wasn't tempted by her. But the fact is, there are men who will be. We had a woman, a young woman, uh, who was working at the, when we used to sell things, they were called cassettes, just, uh, just <laughs> called cassettes. And they, they had little tape and you would put them in a little box and you would press it down and push a button and it would spin and voices would come out of it. Anyway, it was called a cassette. And uh, we used to sell them after church services, you know, of church services and all of that. And I, I was in the back at the kitchen once again at Ontario Christian elementary school where we were meeting and and here comes a young woman and uh, she was wearing I don't know what they're called I'm going to just use what I used to hear you ladies will know what they are and give me the up uh, the update on it if you'd like but we used to call them Daisy Dukes so I know what you know what you know what those are you know yeah yeah I had we had guys in the church who wore those too that was a different ministry but anyway no, she was wearing and what they used to call a crop top so that her waist was exposed. So she's wearing Daisy Dukes in this. And I came walking into the back just before I taught. And there she is, was. And I said, ah, that's probably not a good idea. Though we did sell a lot of tapes that day. But anyway. <laughs> no, I walked up and I said, Again, I don't talk to him, so I, I went to one of the women. And I said, could you please let her know that this isn't the proper way to dress in a, in a church? So she, thank God, she went home, she changed and came back, and, and everything was, was better. You know, it, it, God has created men to be visible. We see things, in other words, visual, rather. And, and yes, we do. We notice things. We notice things before we notice your face. I mean, we notice things. That's just the way men are. That's how we're created. I'm, I'm not opposed to that. That's how I am. You know, Adam looked at Eve, and he saw her, and he said, whoa, woman. You know, so he, he, he that actually is a song, by the way. You are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man is actually lyrical. That's an actual song. So he sang when he saw her, but he saw her and sang to her. We have been created to notice, and we do. That's why Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Young man or man, period, make a covenant with your eyes. Make a covenant with your eyes. Ask God, if you're married, ask God, God, please refresh in me that knowledge that my wife is the most beautiful woman that I'll ever have, that I've ever had. And keep your eyes on her. Don't be thinking of all the women around you that can be so attractive that that would never have gone out with you anyway. <laughs> Don't be thinking like that. Just pray that God will work in you that kind of love for her. As I looked up just now, I noticed I'm not going to finish this chapter. I'm in verse 1. <laughs> So I'll take you for 20 more minutes, and then we'll pick up next time. So make that, make that decision. This actually, I think, for some fellas, and women included today also, of course, 
Um, this is something that that is very important. The Lord, a long time ago, um, blessed me. He gave me a father who loved his wife. My dad loved my wife. My wife, no, he didn't. <laughs> loved his wife. Well, he loved my wife too, but he loved his wife. <laughs> My dad loved his wife with all of his heart. And my dad taught me to do the same. So I've always been, and thank God for that, even as a dating, a kid dating once in a while, I was the guy that was just, I haven't any desire for somebody else if I have this one. That was just me. So I learned it from my dad. And I watched my dad. And I saw my dad never looked at Anybody else? I saw my dad was very dignified. I saw my father as warm and caring, but not he was not a man that another woman would ever come up and even in the Hispanic home, the Mexican home, where you will give the only people that he allowed to kiss him who were women were his daughters, you know, my 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 wife, his daughters-in-law. My dad was very proper. And I watched that and I grew up that way and I thought that's the best way to be as a man. Had I not become a, a Christian, I'll be honest with you, I just still believe that because the one that I have is the one that I want to stay with. So thank God I'm a, a one woman man. But Job was too. And he said, I made a covenant, an agreement with my eyes. Why should I look upon a young woman? It's not just noticing. Why should I stare at her and dress, undress her with my eyes and desire? He was a very powerful man. He could have had pretty much anyone he wanted because power is attractive. And you know what else is? Righteousness. Righteousness and power combined is very, very, money is very powerful. And so he said, no, a long time ago as a young man, I made a decision. Why should I look upon a young woman? And so I encourage all of us to do that. Yes, and that's how the Lord wants to work within us. And women, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, Paul said this, I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety. So men have a certain thing we do, and, and women have the thing that they do. During the summer, it seems that sometimes women forget that men don't go blind for three months. <laughs> That's enough. So in verse 2, well, we are <laughs> moving through this passage. For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? What is the fruit of doing such things? How is God going to deal with them? Well, he says it is destruction. That word destruction speaks of the ruin, the ruin of body and even soul. He says it is destruction, it is ruin, and it is disaster. The word disaster speaks of, of alienation or separation from God. It is the ruin of body and soul and alienation from God. When people are, are guilty of such things, God brings judgment, and he doesn't bless that. God is aware, he's saying, of everything, and God is aware of secret things. He's aware of my walk, every step I take, so I want to walk in a way that pleases him. But he's aware, like it says in Psalm 90, verse 8, you have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. So God is aware of everything. And so he says, does he not see my ways and count all my steps? Verse 5, if I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales that God may know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way or my heart walked after my eyes or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me, let me sow and another eat. Yet, yes, let my harvest be rooted out. And so if I have dealt deceitfully, if I have taken financial advantage of other people, 
then, then judge me. And I am open, he's saying. I'm open to, to man's judgment. I, I'm open to man's scrutiny because in that judgment, God will see my innocence. When he says in verse 7, uh, if my step is turned from the way or my heart walked after my eyes or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow and another eat. Yes, let my harvest be rooted out. If I have stepped from the narrow path of righteousness, if I've desired forbidden things, if I've ripped people off to make more money, then let others get those profits. He says in verse 8, let everything I have been, I have be taken from me and given to others. So what he's doing is he's calling down curses upon himself. He's saying, basically, let me labor for someone else and not benefit from all the work that I do. In verse 9, if my heart has been enticed by a woman or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down over her. That's a very very powerful and personal thing that he just said. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, he, he's continuing his defense against the charge of hypocrisy. So he's saying, if, if I've been attempting to seduce someone else's wife, well, let my wife become his servant. He's speaking of grinding grain. And grinding grain is the lowest of the work that slaves would do at that time. And not only that, but in verse 10, he says, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down over her. That's a very delicate way of saying, may the man who is her owner, the slave owner, take sexual pleasure in my wife. That's a very strong statement for Job to say. May, may her employer exercise his right to sexually use her. It's a very strong thing. In other words, I'm not guilty and therefore that will never happen. But that's how strongly he feels about this. In verse 11, he says, for that would be wickedness. Yes, it would be iniquity deserving of judgment. For that would be a fire that consumes to destruction and would root out all my increase. So he says that would be wickedness. He's speaking of adultery here. And he's saying this adultery, being with another man's wife, is an enormous sin and it deserves terrible punishment. You need to remember that this was written before Moses was given the law called the law of Moses. And so the commandments had yet to be given when, when Job actually occurred. But later on, when God gave the law to Moses, he, he gave him a law pertaining to uh, adultery. And uh, under the law of Moses, this is interesting and true, uh, Adultery is a sin, but not just a sin. It's a sin that is, comes under what is called the capital punishment. It's a sin that is punishable by death. That's how serious this particular sin is. In Leviticus 20, verse 10, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. That is a very serious sin, has always been. And so later on, it was put in the law. But even now, he's speaking about how terrible that particular sin is. It's an enormous sin, he's saying, and it deserves punishment. He says in verse 12, for that would be a fire that consumes to destruction and would root out all my increase. Th this sin, he said, that is fueled by lust would be a sin that should rightly receive the most severe of judgment. In verse 13, if I have despised the cause of my male or female servant when they complained against me, what then shall I do when God rises up, when he punishes? How shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? And so he's making it very clear that uh, they share the same humanity. You see, Aliphaz, remember one of his friends had insinuated that Job favored the rich and the powerful over the poor. But Job is saying that he treated both men and women like they were his own family because like I just read in verse 15, because we share the same humanity and therefore I've treated them fairly. That's the point he's making. Now that 
is something that we see later on repeated that thought in the book of Colossians in the New Testament in chapter 4 verse 1 where it said Paul said masters provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven and so he's saying he's already doing that which was commanded later in the New Testament in verse 16 he continues if I have kept the poor from their desire or caused the eyes of the widow to, to fail or eaten my morsel by myself so that the fatherless could not eat of it. But from my youth I reared him as a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or any poor man without covering, if his heart has not blessed me, and if he was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless when I saw I when I saw I had help in the gate, then let my arm fall from my shoulder. Let my arm be torn from the socket. For destruction from God is a terror to me. And because of his magnificence, I cannot endure. He begins to share all of the good things that he's done. The, the works that he has performed on behalf of, of the helpless, the widows and, and the orphans. And, and as we went through this list, he, he says that I've provided for the proper needs of the poor. I've moved quickly to help widows. I've shared my food with those in need. I have fed and treated orphans as if they were my own children. I've always cared for the needs of the widows and have clothed the needy. I, I have given them occasion to bless me. I've never abused the helpless, an orphan. And I've judged their cases fairly and graciously. And he's saying this because these are the works of a righteous man. These are the things that those who know the Lord, these are the things that they do, that this concern they have for those who have need. And, and they, don't, they don't act righteous on the outside, but their hearts being far away from the things that please God. These are people who really do that which is proper and real. And remember in Matthew chapter 23, verse 14, this is something that the Lord spoke of, what Jesus spoke of, when he said in Matthew 23, 14, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. You, you walk around town as religious individuals pretending that you care when in fact you don't. You devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. It is stated that, that during the days of Christ that a rabbi would have somebody approach them on occasion and, and the rabbi would be requested for prayer. And, and so the rabbi would be expecting them to give him a gift. And if they didn't give him a gift that was large, his prayer would be short. And so Jesus says, for pretense, you make long prayers. Long prayers because they gave you a lot of money to pray. That's the point that he's making. And so Job is saying, I'm not a hypocrite. I, I've done these things sincerely, all of these things that we just read. I've done them. Why? Well, James tells us in chapter 1, verse 27 of his book, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. So the, 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 the activity of a truly righteous person is to care for those who are in need. That's what he's saying. It's interesting how he... How he calls a curse upon himself. Look at verse 22. Let my arm fall from my shoulder. Let my, let my arm be torn from the socket. For destruction from God is a terror to me, and because of his magnificence I cannot endure. That's an interesting way of putting it. So sure am I of my innocence, then I'm, I'll call a curse upon myself. Now, as I was reading this and, and looking at my commentators, they made an interesting point. When you look at the word arm, let my arm fall from my shoulder, when he says, let my arm be torn from the socket, um, the, the it's talking about an entire pulling off from the shoulder blade down. The, the second word arm there is in reference really to that which is below the elbow. So this is a very poetic way of saying, may my entire from my shoulder blade be just pulled right out of me. Let my shoulder blade separate and may my arm fall off below the elbow. If I have used my strength wrongly, is what he's saying. If I've used my abilities wrongly, may those abilities be taken from me. He says in verse 23, for destruction from God is a terror to me 
and because of his magnificence I cannot endure. My fear of God moves me to do that which is right. And even if I did wrong, I wouldn't continue in it. In Proverbs 10, 27, it reads, The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. In verse 24, If I have made gold my hope or said to find gold, you are my confidence. If I have rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand had gained much, if I have observed the sun when it shines or the moon moving in brightness so that my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity deserving of judgment for I would have denied God who is above. This is interesting how he's putting this. He's speaking about trusting in riches. Verse 24, if I made gold my hope or said to find gold, you are my confidence. He's saying, if I have trusted in riches, then God has a right to judge me for that. But the truth is, I haven't trusted in riches. The psalmist in Psalm 62 says it like this in verse 10, trust not in oppression, become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. In Mark 10, 24, the dis disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? And then finally, in 1 Timothy 6, 17, Paul said, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. If you put your hope in anything, put it in God. He says in verse 26, if I have observed the sun when it shines, the moon moving in brightness so that my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity deserving of judgment, for I would have denied God who is above. If I've become an idolater, worshiping the sun or worshiping the moon. Now, that's pretty obvious how he put that, right? He, sa he says that if I've observed the sun, the moon moving in brightness. But notice verse 27. What does he mean when he says, so that my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand? What does that mean? Well, we've seen this before. All of us have seen it. It's an act of worship when people... We'll do that. And that's what he's saying. If I have made a gesture of worship. So it's speaking of idolatry. This is a sin that is worthy of God's judgment. The sin of idolatry. In Levit Leviticus 19 verse 4, it says, Do not turn to idols or make metal gods for yourself. I am the Lord, your God. You see, our God is the living God. And idols are dead, useless, and unable to save like it says in Judges 10, 14, go and cry out to the gods you've chosen. Let them save you when you're in trouble. And then he goes on. I think I'm going to finish. Then he goes on. We shall see. If I have rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me or lifted myself up when evil found him, indeed, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse on his soul. If the men of my tent have not said, who is there that has not been satisfied with his meat? But no, so no sojourner had to lodge in the street, for I have opened my doors to the, to the traveler. If I have covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, because I feared the great multitude, dreaded the contempt of families, so that I kept silence and didn't go out of the door. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me that my prosecutor had written in a book. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder, bind it on me like a crown. I would declare to him the number of my steps like a prince. I would approach him. And so he begins to speak concerning these things in verse 29 and 30 when he says, if I've rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me, lifting myself up, if I have in my heart wished evil to others and, and desired their ruin, which he hasn't, he says, uh, then I would be culpable, then I could be judged. Like it says in Proverbs 24, 17, do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. In verse 31 and 32, he speaks of the men of his tent, and they're saying uh, concerning uh, 
who, who is it that has not been satisfied with your food, with the meat? He's saying, I've been hospitable to everybody. Uh, I, my own relatives have said that I'm extremely generous. I've opened the door of my home uh, to, to, to house a traveler in need. So I've been generous in 33 and 34. If I've covered my transgression as Adam. Now, remember, Adam held inside his iniquity. He tried to hide it from the Lord. He, he fashioned uh, fig leaves as a covering. So he's saying, I haven't been a hypocrite. I haven't hid my sin from the sight of others. In 35 through 37, he, he says, oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. I, I wish God would hear my case. Here's my signature, agreeing that I have told the truth. If my prosecutor wrote out my charges, I would sign them, and under it I would say, I am not guilty. Verse 36, surely I would carry it on my shoulder and bind it on me like a crown. I would, I would carry the, the book of charges like a badge of honor, and I wouldn't be ashamed, because the charges are groundless, and when proven wrong, they will reveal my innocence. In verse 37, I would declare to him the number of my steps like a prince. I would approach him. I could point to an entire life, the number of my steps, an entire life of desiring to walk pleasing to him. And like a prince, I could stand with courage and confidence before him. And finally, if my land cries out against me and its furrows weep together, if I have eaten its fruit without money and or cause its owners to lose their lives, then let thistles grow instead of wheat and weeds instead of barley. If I've gotten my property by fraud, if I've stolen its fruit by killing its owners, then may God judge me. When he says, may the gr ground be cursed, I am innocent of all the charges that have been lodged against me. And I'm willing to have everything looked at closely because I have walked in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. And all of these accusations that have been made against me would be found to be false. And so Job finishes his defense. We'll stop here. We made it. And we'll pick up next week. Our Father, I want to begin by saying once again before everybody and with everybody how thankful we are that you are God and you are on the throne and you are alive and you are all powerful and there shall nothing be impossible with you. I want to thank you on behalf of of Rob and Val and the family for touching Risa the way you did. And we pray that you continue to do so. And some of us in this room or perhaps who are watching online, some of us are lifting to you right now prayers, asking that you would be merciful on behalf of those whom we know and love also. And God, I do pray that you would be, that you would be a healing God, that you would do a work, Lord, and that you would receive all the glory. For there are some in our own fellowship, in our own church family, who are dealing with illnesses that the doctor has already said cannot be dealt with, cannot be cured. But you are the God of the possible, and there shall nothing be impossible with you. So we ask, Lord, that you would show mercy and you would have your way. We also ask that we might live our lives with integrity. We see the words that were shared here by Job in his defense and and how he's pointing to a life that really has been lived in an, in an attempt to be pleasing to you. May we live lives pleasing to you, but may we also know that there are times, seasons of affliction and pain that you actually will ultimately use to fashion us into the, the person you want us to be. And I ask that we would not be angry at you for the work that sometimes may even hurt. Lord, I lift up this congregation. I lift up those who are watching online for the countries that are tuning in right now. And I pray, Lord, for every one of those countries and those who are watching. And I pray that we who have heard this word would leave this place making a covenant with our own eyes that we, Lord, would live a pure, pure life before you. We lift these things to you. And even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed for another moment, perhaps there's some in this room or online who need to get right with the Lord right now, and you need prayer. And if you need to get right with the Lord, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right now. Father, in Jesus' name, you see the hands of those in this room who are saying, yes, Lord, I ask that you would reach down and you would touch, that you would, as they open their heart to you, wash them and cleanse them, forgive them, 
and give them a sense of your presence with them, Lord, even right now. I ask, Lord, that you would do so because it, it honors you. And a transformed life is, is a testimony of your grace. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, reach down, touch as our hearts are open to you. And, Lord, have your way. By faith, we receive from you, and we give you praise for this. And we thank you, and we bless you. You can put your hands down. And, Lord, I ask that you keep moving in our lives. As we're about to leave, may we go with you and serve you. And tomorrow, as the nation is called to prayer, wherever we are, may we lift up prayer for this nation. It's in deep need of prayer. So we lift it to you now, in Jesus' name, amen.